Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening for our last education series event for 2020. It's definitely like this year, been an unusual uh, series of education series events, but we're so happy that you are joining us this evening. So before we get started into discussing homelessness, we would love for you to uh, get signed in to our poll everywhere, which we're going to be doing some live polling. And the way you're going to do that is either on your smartphone or on your computer, open up a browser and go to pollev.com slash CO coalition. Just make sure you're entering that slash CO coalition. And you can choose to remain anonymous or you can enter your name, uh, but what will be coming up on the screen as you answer will not be shown on my screen. So we wanna get started uh, with our first polling question and find out where everyone lives. Uh, so once you are signed in, you can drop your pin on where your location is. Looks like we might be having some issues with the poll everywhere. Let's see. Meredith, do you think you might be able to share your screen with the presentation while I get this fixed? Give me one second. Okay. Have to love doing everything virtual because there's going to be something that doesn't go right. Uh, so thanks for bearing with us here. Um, okay. There we go. That looks right. So can everyone there? That's lovely. Awesome. What a lot of Denverites tonight. This is a little bit unusual for um, for this type of event, but that's great. We have lots of information to share about Denver, Jefferson County, Arapahoe County. Awesome. So this is our second polling question. Go ahead and pick A, B, C, or D. You have an acquaintance um, or someone who is currently experiencing homelessness. We don't know anyone. These are this is a really good starting point. So I'm glad that we are going to have this conversation. Perfect, perfect. We'll give you five more seconds to get your count in. Okay, good majority of folks who don't know anyone experiencing homelessness. So that will be really an important conversation for us to have. So let's move on and get started with Joyce. So Joyce is um, one of my favorite stories to tell uh, because number one, she's a real human. And uh, number two, it kind of defeats all of the norms of people experiencing homelessness of what we think is happens. So you'll see Joyce's sign says, you'll never know when illness hits and all you want to do is go home. So this is a really interesting time frame, right? To see that um, Joyce is really um, 
to, is wanting to not have to experience her sickness at home, but wants to be able to, or on the streets, but wants to be able to do that at home. Joyce had a job and was doing just fine, and then um, illness struck, and Joyce had her first heart attack. She had her second heart attack and lost her job. And by her third heart attack, she was found on the streets in Denver by one of our outreach workers. Um, she didn't do anything wrong, quote unquote. It was just something that happened to her. And um, that happens to a lot of the people in our world and in our community. Okay. So here right now is a um, total number of people experiencing homelessness throughout the entire country. This number is a gross underestimate of people experiencing homelessness. And Jill's gonna explain to you a little bit why that might be. Um, but we anticipate that this number is about 3.5 times as many people who are experiencing homelessness nationally. So we want to talk about how we do know that half a million number that's happening nationally. And that is through the point in time count. This is a national count that is done every year. And it's with service providers and volunteers from the community that are going out and physically counting people that are currently experiencing homelessness. So the, the survey, which has always been a paper survey up until I think two years ago, which finally went digital, uh, is collecting quite a bit of information. So it's collecting demographic information like age, gender, race, ethnicity, um, whether that person is an individual or they're part of a family, and if they're an unaccompanied youth, which in Colorado is up to age 25. If they are an unaccompanied youth, they have a whole other set of questions, uh, including if that person is being trafficked. It also includes length of homelessness, if they are unsheltered or sheltered, and if they're experiencing chronic homelessness. And according to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, chronic homelessness is defined as someone experiencing homelessness for one year continuously, or having three periods of homelessness over five years. The other information that is asked is if someone has a substance use disorder, if they have a mental illness, if they're actively fleeing domestic violence, or uh, and their HIV AIDS status. So the point in time count goes off of HUD's definition of homelessness, and that is just one of two things. It is whether someone is sheltered or unsheltered. Sheltered meaning someone staying in emergency or transitional shelters, or if they're unsheltered, this is someone that's sleeping outside um, in an encampment, um, in a park. Um, what is not counted, and this is the key of where we're seeing such a discrepancy between that half a million number we know and what we think is probably closer to 3.5 million, is the um, during that 24-hour count that uh, we are taking the survey of the point-in-time count, if during that 24-hour period that we are counting people and where they stayed that night, we're not counting people if they were in jails during that time, whether they were in the hospital, if they had their own money and got a motel room, if they're couch surfing, staying on someone's couch, or uh, people that are living in cars. So if you're taking all of the people that are in these locations during that 24 hour count at the 24 hour period that the point in time count is happening, that's why we think that that number is definitely closer to 3.5 million. And not to mention that it is all voluntary. Sorry, there's a lag over here. Jill, give me a second. There we go. So as I mentioned, if there is, the pit is point in time, as we call pit, is not perfect and it's not close to perfect, but there are some benefits to the point in time count. 
one, it provides a snapshot of demographics and trends, whether there's more service needs for families or um, individuals who are experiencing chronic homelessness. It's also the, an opportunity for housed community members to connect with uh, unhoused community members. It's probably one of the only times. And it's a chance for community awareness through the media. Often, anytime homelessness is discussed in the media, it's usually pretty negative. Uh, so the point in time count is the time that it's, it's neutral, I think I'd say. So there's a lot of pitfalls as well. Um, volunteer participation varies annually. If you have 10 volunteers one year and 40 volunteers a different year, 10 people cannot count a, an interview as many people as 40. The weather, and, and it's always in January, really um, changes the count dramatically. If it's a warm day in January, less people are gonna be utilizing shelters. And one of the biggest ways that we get the numbers of people experiencing homelessness is from the shelter system. So you can see how those numbers are gonna change a lot. It also depends if you're in rural areas, um, there's, not enough, there's not enough services to be able to go out count, less volunteers, and then of course all the different locations where someone might have slept during that 24-hour period, that is not being counted. Um, so it's the only measure we truly have of counting, but there's a lot to be desired with it. So we want to now talk a little more specifically about Colorado. So this is our point in time count total numbers. This has about 9,619 people. And you'll see in the graph that's on the left hand side that 60% of them are inside Denver Metro. So that's obviously quite a large percentage of people who are experiencing homelessness just here, but that's also where we're doing the counts. So that kind of helps to give you a little bit of an understanding of um, what Jill was explaining around the point in time. So that more volunteers, more service providers, easier to count. Um, some of the things that are interesting to note on the right hand side are people who are unsheltered, um, meaning that they're sleeping in an abandoned building in a car um, on the street itself chronically homeless, which defines someone experiencing homelessness as one year consistently or three times over a five-year period. Um, individuals and families will see that this number keeps going up and um, we anticipate that with COVID that we will see more families experiencing homelessness post-COVID. Um, unaccompanied youth, meaning young people who are under the age of 25 years old, who do not have a parent or someone who's supporting them while they are experiencing homelessness. Now, this is also pretty interesting to see that there was a count that is not related to the point in time count that was done by um, uh, Denver uh, Homeless Out Loud. And their group, what they looked at was to count all of the tents that were in Denver. And they just wanted to see, you know, if we're talking about point in time, how many people are we talking about in Denver compared to the entire and they saw 664 tents in Denver city and county alone. And that they were equating that to about 1300 people. So we know that throughout the state that we're, we're actually counting 2000 people, but that number obviously must be much higher. Overrepresented populations. It's, um, this graph is so, so just dramatic to me and is really indicative of um, people experiencing homelessness and those who are in um, Black or African communities, multi-race Native Americans, when we're talking about three or four times. So you'll see the white part is people experiencing homelessness and the yellow piece is um, the general population. So for Black or African Americans, three to four times the um, population is experiencing homelessness. So they're just significantly more impacted. We wrote um, two reports that at the end of this, well, you'll have access to all of these things, so you'll be able to see. Um, one that was on LGBTQ issues, because that is certainly an underrepresented population that's not in this graph. But then we also did one recently, just came out about a week ago, on race, ethnicity, and homelessness. So you'll see some really interesting things in those um, documents that'll really explain a lot more about uh, overrepresentation throughout. 
will you give you a sec to take out your phone or get back a hop back on your computer to participate in describe a word a word that you would think that describes homelessness Vulnerable, traumatic, inaccessible, dehumanized, unnecessary, multi-layered, disenfranchised, misunderstood, desperate, hopelessness, traumatic. Well, I'm glad that we're hitting that button, traumatic, because um, we will discuss that definitely as we move forward. Give you guys a few more seconds to great. Great, complicated, dangerous, hopelessness, stigmatized, traumatic. Awesome. Okay, I will move us forward now. So just so you're aware that uh, if you have a question throughout this presentation, um, Jill and I just recalled that we didn't introduce ourselves. I'm Meredith Ritchie and then <laughs> Jill Galata, oh, Corbley now, she's married. Um, is with us, but also our colleague Ryan Camp is kind of doing the back end stuff with us right now. And he will be kind of fielding all of the questions that you have throughout this. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and he will, um, he just introduced himself. So um, please feel free to ask them to him and he will go ahead and then shoot those over to us as we get closer. So ask away throughout the entire presentation and then we'll get to as many as we can. We'll pause a few times so that uh, it'll give us a chance to catch up if you had a question that was related to a topic we just talked about. We want to talk about the causes of homelessness. I saw that in our last poll everywhere question, I saw multi-layered. And so we definitely are going to be talking about that because we know when someone falls into homelessness, it's not just Jill, your audio is worse. Sorry to tell you, but your is audio it? is worse. Yes. Get, give it one more go ahead. Change your channel. Sorry to pause you guys. Second. Okay, how is it now? Oh, crystal clear. Okay. Let me know if it stops being good. Go okay. forward. Okay. So um, let me just repeat what I was talking about. In our last poll everywhere question, I did notice that somebody submitted uh, multi-layered. And I'm really excited that I did see that because we do know that homelessness doesn't happen because of one reason. It's many different reasons that come together. We like to break up the causes of homelessness into two categories and like more buckets. One being the broken systems and the other being personal barriers. So broken systems are the systematic ways that people tend to fall into homelessness or um, stay in homelessness. So these are just some of the ways, the affordable housing shortage, uh, which we all know in Colorado, we are not able to escape. It is really bad here. Jobs lacking livable wages, generational poverty, uh, there's limited job opportunities in the criminal justice system. Uh, but what we want to talk about is the affordable housing shortage and jobs lacking livable wages. So we're going to show you three maps. Um, and what we really want you to focus on here is the colors of the map. So for this first map here is um, the number of available and affordable rental homes per 100 extremely low income renter households per state. So when you're looking at it here, the darker the color, so red, means less units are available in that state for very low, extremely low income renters. When you're looking at Colorado, we're not in the red this year, but we have been previously. And in order to be red, it's 30 or fewer units. In Colorado statewide, we're 31. So you can see we're just on the border there. And if you're talking about Denver Metro, we are very much in the red. 
The second map here is the hourly wage that a household must earn to afford a two-bedroom apartment. And this comes from the Outer Breach Report that the National Low Income Housing Coalition does every year. And the color here to pay attention to is the darker blue. So the darker the blue is the hourly wage is much higher uh, in order to be able to afford housing. In Colorado, we are dark blue. Statewide, you need over $25 an hour in order to afford a two bedroom, a modest two bedroom apartment. If you live in the Metro Denver area, that number jumps up to $29. And if you live in um, the mountain towns and resort towns, that number goes up into the 30s. This last map that we're gonna look at is the number of people that are experiencing homelessness per state. Now, while we don't have numbers like California, which is over 100,000, or um, uh, Texas, that is over 25,000, we still have a lot of people with almost 10,000. And last year, we did count over 10,000. We don't think that number went down, um, but remembering the point in time count and kind of those number discrepancies. What we're gonna do now is go back and we want you to look at the colors and look at the trends and how the states that are dark in one map tend to be darker in the other states, in those same states. We wanted to show you that way. That way you can see there is a direct correlation between the lack of affordable and available uh, rentals and uh, the lack of livable wages in states really does correlate with the number of people experiencing homelessness. So this, the second piece of that is situational barriers. And these are the things that happen to somebody. They include things like trauma, like which we talked about a little bit when everyone was plugging in their answers. Unexpected medical bills, like Joyce's story. Physical disabilities, substance use disorders, eviction, which we have a huge eviction crisis and we have a moratorium right now that goes through December 31st. But then again, um, December 31st, we might be in a big pickle. Intimate partner violence, lost jobs, and lost wages. But what we want to talk about for a little bit is Trump. This is an article that goes into pretty great depth. And again, don't worry about trying to copy this down. We will send this out so you'll have access to all of this. Um, that discusses the ACE study. And what the ACE study means is adverse childhood experiences. And what that did was assessed, it was a Kaiser study, it happened about now, 15 years ago, um, but it was really, really telling for the time. It assessed people who were actually going in for obesity, and they started to ask all of these questions because they were dieting and they were exercising and all of that stuff that was supposed to help people with obesity, but yet they weren't losing weight or they were falling off the track. And so the more that the, the doctors dug into this, what they decided was that the um, they needed to ask some more questions. And those questions they decided to ask were around their childhoods. And people who experience homelessness are very, very likely to have extremely high ACE scores, meaning they have more of these traumatic events that happened to them in their youth. Um, sometimes the correlation between things like um, homelessness or substance use or even something like cancer can, is exponential to the things that they experience as a child. What we say, and I think this is absolutely just telling of homelessness in itself, is trauma is often the cause, but always the result of homelessness. This cycle that we're showing on the right-hand side can start at any point, right? It could start with childhood tra trauma. It could start with housing instability due to a job loss or a health issue but it kind of keeps going, right? It's just really hard to come out of that cycle. And then when we add on top of that, the impact of COVID, it is, we're, we have a lot of work to do and we're going to see a lot of impacts that will last long after COVID is gone. I also wanna make note around the trauma of COVID itself. So if you're experiencing homelessness, and we're gonna go into a lot more detail around this in a few minutes, um, but if you're experiencing homelessness, you have nowhere to go home when COVID hit. 
And um, that brings more trauma to your life. There's nowhere for you to get care or when all of the stores close and the food that you were relying on is now longer, no longer accessible. That's more traumatic for you experiencing homelessness. Again, this is oh, another study that is really fascinating and I won't go into too much detail on it because there's so many studies and Jill and I get really deep in the weeds on them because they're great. Um, but this one in particular talks about a family or, or families who are now housed 16 months after experiencing homelessness and really always goes back to trauma, always back to trauma. All of these people had experienced some severe trauma either as children themselves were bringing children into that trauma or had trauma as adults. Oh, this is still me. <laughs> so um, all of those things are to say that there's lots of great work that's happening all throughout the entire state and country um, to support people who are experiencing homelessness. And we wanna talk a little bit about what that looks like. So this is pretty much a little, a little look at all of the services that can be offered from any provider. So what we want to show in this is that there's emergency services and those are the things that are kind of the like the trampoline, right? They are what you need immediately when you start to experience homelessness. You need someone who's going to provide socks, someone who's going to provide food, help you figure out where you're going to sleep tonight, um, address all of those immediate needs. And then there's long-term stability, which is all of these other things that are for long-term care, um, getting you employed, helping you have housing, long-term substance use treatment that might take five weeks or five years and anything in between that. Case management, which similarly could mean that you don't need it for very long or that you could need it for most of your life. Um, these happen sometimes intermittently, sometimes they cross paths, sometimes you don't need any or all of these services. These are just all of the things that are available in the community and Denver specifically does all of this stuff as well. Well, we have a lot of services statewide and especially in the Denver metro area and more in metropolitan areas. There are so many gaps and so many um, services that are still needed. One of the biggest things is not enough money. There's not enough money to go around anywhere in the country. Um, that's why the housing wait list is often years long. There's just not enough resources and there's not enough funding. Uh, service hours and locations. So this is, you know, the coalition. We offer a lot of services, but we can't stay open 24 hours. We are more during business hours and shelters before COVID were generally more um, evening time and then folks had to leave early in the morning. What we really want to talk about here is the health conditions by age. People that are experiencing homelessness, especially chronic homelessness, have a life expectancy of someone 30 years younger than the housed population. 30 years. We, we also know as someone that has experienced chronic homelessness, they tend to have health conditions of someone that is 20 years their senior. So we're really seeing people that are living on the streets are incredibly unhealthy because they're so vulnerable to violence and um, different health conditions that with because of lack of access to health care and the elements that they are constantly um, facing. We'll let Ryan pop on if he has any questions that came through or. Yeah, okay, so we have one from Rachel and she says, I'm a peer navigator. Where can I find the most up-to-date organizations that are currently operating? Huh. So a part of that is um, 211 uh, is a great resource and it's gotten much better in recent years so there those resources should be pretty up to date on 211.org um, that can help you find everything from temporary shelter services through long-term supportive housing like we offer so uh, the whole gamut um, i also saw that there was a reply from another person who works at mdhi who had some other resources to offer so thank you 
Yeah, and we have another, add, or go ahead, Jill. I just wanted to add that if you don't have access to internet or anyone you're working with, uh, you can also call 211. And 211 is from um, Mile High United Way. And they are the ones that are um, helping put all those resources together. Great. And then the next question is from Denise, and she asks, with the ongoing pandemic that, um, that we still, that we'll still be under next year, how will the point in time count be conducted? Oof, good question. Uh, we were actually just talking about that this morning um, with our team who, so the coalition conducts, uh, we participate in conducting the point in time count. Um, and so that's going to be a lot of focus on us getting the appropriate volunteers and people who are able to go out into the community to assist with that. Um, and then, Jill, did you have anything else to add to that? That oh, I let's see. Um, Aubrey Haswald, who is on this call, she is our director of the advocacy program. She's kind of behind point in time for the coalition. I just saw a message that we are going to follow the lead of MDHI, so Metro Denver Homeless Initiative, who um, is the one that really conducts the point in time count and helps with all organizations in the Denver metro area. I do imagine that we're still going to be able to do a good amount of counting for the point in time count because the numbers, oh, most of them do come from service providers and folks are utilizing shelters shelter, um, shelters and services, and services generally have not shut down because of COVID. I have one more question um, from Risa. She says, I know we talked about this at the beginning, but how would you define homelessness since there's so many factors besides just living on the street? Jill, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I would say, and I, I, I would say the coalition uh, would say as well, that anyone without a fixed address uh, is experiencing homelessness. This is also people that are sleeping in motel rooms are experiencing homelessness because there is not security. If someone does not have a fixed address, um, they're not able to thrive as someone that has stability and has a home of their own. Ryan, you got any more with that? The last one. We've got one more that might need some clarification. Um, are there any plans to include the people that are not counted presently? And then do all counties do the point in time count? Do you work together to formulate a regional response? So um, there are different states that do an extended count that is not submitted to the Department of um, Housing and Urban Development to HUD. And th these numbers do sometimes include jail counts. Um, I think there are a couple that have done hospital counts as well. And when they have done these counts, the number does go up dramatically. But we are, with the point in time count, it is not up to service providers on what data is actually used officially. So I don't know if there's any plan to kind of change this. This is all based on HUD's definition of homelessness and it can change, but I don't know of anything changing. Um, Meredith, do you want to answer that second half? Probably more about the, um, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on the word, the different groups? You lost me, Ryan. Will you repeat that second part again to me, please? Yeah. Um, do all counties do the point in time count and do you work together to formulate a regional response? So there are um, different groups who are doing the count. So they're all coordinated through um, what are called COCs. And COCs are a continuum of care and that's a region. So this is going to get in the weeds a little bit. So I'm not going to go too deep down this hole, but I'll, I'll give you a few keywords that can give you some search tools. So a COC, a continuum of care, is a region of um, a state that in Colorado we have three. Is that right, Jill? It's Metro Denver, everything else, which is the continuum of care. And then I believe Colorado Springs has its own. Yep. 
So three total, and they each coordinate as best they can with the resources that they have to get that total count. So it depends on, so that's how they're all coming like filtered through one system, but they are doing the way they're counting is based off of their resources, the, um, the service providers that are, that are in that region, how they have volunteers, if they're in a rural community, how are they doing that? Um, there's lots of variables into that and each state does it differently. So it depends on really how the, um, the volunteers are coming through to, to provide that count. Um, one so, more quick one. Um, someone asked, I work at RTD, do you think it would be beneficial to have a data point to receive information on how many homeless individuals rely on public transportation? Yeah, I think that would absolutely be beneficial to know. Um, especially I think as colder weather months or people depending more on RTD as a place to stay warm or not. Um, and what does that kind of look like would be fascinating to know. Uh, unfortunately, HUD determines the questions. So we don't get to pick what the questions are uh, that are that are on the um, point in time count. So that's kind of an interesting point is that it would be ideal for us to know a lot more data on um, the people in our community, but it's we're kind of locked into the way that the, um, the, the feds do it. So we're going to move on now so that we can get to everything we need to for today. So we talked a bit about the different service areas that are available, and now we want to talk about ourselves, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, and we want to talk about our service areas as well as the advocacy work we're doing and some of the really cool innovative approaches we're taking. Mm -hmm. uh, the four service areas that we, that we focus on is housing, healthcare, supportive services, and then the non-service um, specific uh, arm of the organization is advocacy, which is Meredith and my team, we're part of the education and advocacy team. So for housing, we have both permanent supportive housing and affordable housing. Permanent supportive housing is exactly like what it says. Uh, we know that you can't provide somebody housing, get them into housing and say goodbye, you know, we're done, good luck with you know, your life and hopefully you stay housed. We know that a lot of people, especially someone that has experienced chronic homelessness for years, they need someone to be able to help them teach them life skills, uh, work through their goals, help them with public benefits, whatever they might need. We have 19 housing properties at this point and we're really excited. We just had our grand opening of our newest property that will be specifically for veterans and their immediate families in Aurora. And they will be part of the over 3,000 households that we assist each year. So we want to talk about innovations in housing because I think there are some really incredible things that we're doing at the coalition um, that are really unique to us. The first, if you haven't heard of the Renaissance Downtown Lofts, um, the Social Impact Bond Project, this is just a fascinating project that that is actually renowned around the entire country. Uh, there are only a few other states who have even tried this project before. And really what social impact bond mean, it's a public-private partnership where it was an investment to see if we housed a hundred of our highest utilizers of the criminal justice system um, and the emergency services, would we save money by having them housed? And so with the city of Denver, we and a, and a number of other partners, we did this. Um, and now it's a few years old. And we're able to say that, yes, we saw that there was a huge decrease of people needing to use those services because now they were housed and had proper access to health care and didn't need emergency services and weren't trying to, who weren't being picked up for public intoxication or for sleeping on the sidewalk. None of those things um, were happening anymore. So we were seeing that it was a huge cost savings to taxpayers. So this project is something that the city, when they saw how well we were doing, they and this was a partnership with MDHI, um, sorry, not MDHI. Yep, no, no, I'm gonna get that wrong. So. <laughs> Oh, um, well, it was with the city and county of Denver um, and then um, MHCD. 
there we go. I always get those M acronyms confused. MHCD, um, and they, so together we were able to not just have this building, but then also provide additional 75 units of housing throughout the city because the city said, this is great. This is going really well. Um, so this is an example of a project that we can look to replicate throughout the state because we know that it is really successful. Um, what's also interesting about this is when we approached these 100 people, one person said, no, thank you. I don't want to live in that building. One of the 100. So I think that that is really telling of when people, we hear a lot of these comments or uh, myths of homelessness that say people don't want to be housed. That's absolutely not true in this example. Another example we want to show you is Fusion Studios. Um, and how this is a really unique project is that this was a former hotel that we converted into mini apartments um, for people who are experiencing homelessness. The interesting thing about this is when you have a project that's already an existing space, it takes you way less time to convert it than to build it from the ground up. So we were able to open this space in 11 months as opposed to three years that it might take us to build from the ground up. So it's a huge cost and at one third of the price. So it's a huge cost savings for us to do something like that for all of those resources, but then it's also something that we can do much faster. So that building opened last um, February, and we are always looking to replicate projects like that as well. The next arm of the coalition is our healthcare services. Back when we started the Coalition for the Homeless, over 30 years ago at this point, we actually started with healthcare, with the idea that Denver was going to solve homelessness, we would be around for a little while, provide healthcare, and then we would get to go away. We know that that is not true and our need for services grows every year. Right now, we are serving over 15,000 patients each year with our main health center, the Stout Street Health Center that's located on Stout and 21st downtown. Uh, and then we have five satellite locations spread out in Denver Metro and one in Southeast Colorado, which is a part of a really cool program that Meredith will be talking about in just a moment. So I think we changed this. So we're gonna talk about something else that's really innovative, telemedicine. Um, this is really cool because COVID, this is one of the silver linings of COVID. Um, before COVID, we were always trying to get telemedicine to work because a program like you're seeing right here, this is in Fort Lyon, um, which is in Los Animas, Colorado, one of our programs there, that's a peer-led recovery program. Um, it's, it's pretty rural, and so it's difficult to get doctors and everyone down there frequently to provide care. But what's really great is that we can provide telemedicine there. Um, we couldn't do that without getting a hole in our pocket until 2020 when the legislative session allowed for us to get reimbursed for way more services than we were in the past. So that allows us to do this extensively. Um, and I know that a lot of people have benefited from telemedicine throughout our communities, experiencing homelessness or not. Um, and one of the questions that we want to kind of demystify a little bit is, okay, what we're saying telemedicine for somebody who doesn't necessarily have internet access. Um, we know that lifelines for people experiencing homelessness are their phones. Um, that's how they apply for jobs. That's how they apply for benefits. That's how they know that places are open. Um, and so having a telephone is definitely something that a lot of people experiencing homelessness do in fact have. So for us to be able to have people who can reach our doctors and nurses who can reach out and call someone or video chat with them and see what's going on is really helpful for us to be able to do. Another cool thing that I wanna show you is street medicine. So you'll see on the right, Nina is wearing this backpack. Um, on the left is the backpack all opened up. This allows us to go out into the field with this really cool fancy backpack that has all of these really cool tools inside of it to help us do some assessments of people who are living on the streets. And then that will go to a doctor who's in one of our clinics somewhere else. So we don't have to send tons of resources out into the community. We can send a nurse or two nurses out to do this work and then determine if we need to have someone come into the clinic or if we can do that care right there on the street. 
Um, and this is a lot about building, uh, meeting people where they're at, but also building relationships and um, mutual respect so that we're not forcing people to, to do something they're not interested or, or able to do necessarily. Asking someone to go a mile when they have all of their belongings right next to them um, is a really big ask. So this allows us to go to them. And that's a really big deal to get to do. Our next area that we want to highlight is the support services. This really is the everything else. This is employment services, our child care center, um, part of healthcare, but our substance use treatment that we offer, uh, and a really cool Fort Lyon program that Meredith mentioned a bit that I think she'll talk about after. This is for, I think, our employment services. Am I right, Meredith, on this one? Oh, all of these numbers here? Yeah. This includes everything. So this includes, oh, this includes everything. everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're providing a lot of support services to folks, almost 6,000. And what I think is important about these numbers is that we're having people come back. So we're not just serving uh, folks one time, we're supporting people long-term meeting their goals. So one of the innovations in sports services is the Fort Lyon program that I was just mentioning too. So Fort Lyon is a supportive residential community. It's for people who are recovering from substance use. Um, the, important, the important part in that is supportive community. So um, it's peer led, meaning that all of the residents determine the programs, how they participate, what they're going to do there. Um, and there's some programming throughout that, which includes things like what you're looking at right now, which is an art class that one of um, the residents there is taking. There's also a bike work or a bike shop where you can fix your bikes and um, have those available. There's uh, access to the community colleges there, which is really key for people in their recovery to find something that they want to do and be, um, which has been really, really helpful and successful for, for us as well. Um, and then the last piece of that is there is a um, health clinic there. So that health clinic is accessible to all of the residents who can stay up to three years at this program. And that's kind of what makes it different than a lot of substance use treatment programs in the state, which there aren't very many of anymore as that's always challenging. Um, but we see that the longer people have access to these services, the more they're going to stick to their recovery. So that's really key is allowing people to have time to reset, to rest, to figure out what they're going to do um, and give them time to, to get all of those ducks in a row, um, which is hard to do in a 60 day program or a 90 day program. So that's really the benefit of this space. And it's on this really beautiful campus with chickens and just so much green space. And it's just really lovely to be down there to have a place to uh, recuperate. The last area, this is not our support services or um, our direct services, I should say. This is our advocacy. So this is our grassroots lobbying, uh, our grassroots advocacy and our direct lobbying. And we really need the support of the community. You are here. I, we saw that a lot of you do not have a personal connection to homelessness, but you're here because you're advocates. We hope that you will sign up for our emails. At the end of the presentation, we'll have the link to do so. And look out for our emails because we sent out a lot of advocacy action alerts, especially during the legislative session. And we have a lot of success with our advocates during the last legislative session. We had over 700 emails sent to legislators. And with the help of our advocates, we were able to have 20 bills with our desired outcome from the very unusual legislative session we had this year. Absolutely. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about COVID because this is kind of the elephant in the room and something that we absolutely need to address and pay homage to as we move forward because a lot has changed um, and a lot will continue to change in the way that we provide services. So uh, what we wanna talk a little bit about that I think is really key to this conversation is vulnerability. So uh, people experiencing homelessness don't have access to sanitation all of the time. 
um, they don't have a way to quarantine if they are found to be ill. Um, often they're in encampments or they're in shelter settings, so that's a really easy way for a community spread to occur. They have higher susceptibility due to declining health, as Jill talked a little bit about in the beginning, um, and lack of access to healthcare. Again, that idea of going a mile feels like going to the moon. So this was one of the articles that was in um, Denverite, which says, what does it mean to stay at home when you don't have a home? And this was really kind of an impulse for us to recognize throughout the city and state um, is what were we going to do um, when we see that it's really easy for us who have a home to quarantine and to do the things necessary to avoid this, but really hard to do um, when you're experiencing homelessness. So there were a bunch of brilliant minds who came together and figured out a bunch of strategies to address homelessness in a COVID-19 world. That first looked like we need to de-densify. So um, that meant that all of our shelter spaces need to come to half capacity. We need to figure out how to do screening and testing so that we could make sure people were adequately screened and tested so that they could access the services that they need to, but then also access the healthcare that they needed. That came with what became activated rested, respite or protective action hotel rooms, 800 hotel rooms, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, um, throughout the city of Denver, which came from a lot of goodwill of um, owners of these hotels who helped us to get people who, one, they, some of the buildings would be specifically for people who tested positive or who were in recovery from COVID. And then the rest of those hotels were protective action, meaning people who are high risk of and really susceptible to getting COVID could be there to make sure that they were not constantly being exposed by being outside. We needed to figure out more long-term housing options. Um, because again, where do you go when you don't have a home? And we don't know how long COVID is going to last. So um, that was really key as we move forward. And that housing stock, we need, again, that map that Jill was showing you in the beginning uh, with those number of affordable and available units. We need more of those. Vouchers and services. We also needed immediate care now for people. So like Meredith talked about a bit um, with these activated respite and protective action motel and hotel rooms, that is just some of the ways that the coalition and other service providers in Denver, along with the city and county of Denver, are really working to combat COVID-19 when it comes to people experiencing homelessness. So we did secure over 800 uh, hotel and motel rooms. Uh, we were able to do this by the shelter system. A lot of the shelters moved into uh, um, providing 24 seven services. So folks actually have access to be able to seek the services that they need at any time. Our street outreach team and other street outreach teams are providing masks and hygiene items to people that are unsheltered. And then the big question that is in the community a lot is the safe outdoor space. And whether that might be coming, uh, we hear two locations have been identified with churches, but we haven't seen that yet, but hoping that would become um, space soon. Want you to take um, a look at some of this data. This is updated as of, I believe, Monday or Tuesday with, um, with Denver Public Health. What we're looking at here is the number of people that uh, have tested positive that are experiencing homelessness and then people that are not experiencing homelessness. So when we're looking at this bar graph, the blue are the number of people that have experienced um, who are not experiencing homelessness that have tested positive. So we kind of know this trend, right? It went up pretty high back um, in the spring and summer and then dropped down and going back up again. And the trend pretty much followed the same for people experiencing homelessness that were testing positive. The difference I think a little bit is that the number is not going up as much for people experiencing homelessness right now. And I believe it's probably because the number is spiking or it started to spike with the general population due to the younger um, population in, in colleges and in schools. But we really wanna focus here is while the number of cases 
uh, in, for all cases, it's only 3% for people experiencing homelessness out of the full population. However, 21% of people experiencing homelessness that are testing positive for COVID wind up in the hospital. And this is compared to just 8% of cases for the general population. So this just really goes back to people that are experiencing homelessness are so vulnerable to COVID and they have a lot of underlying health conditions that is making such a huge jump from 8% hospitalized for the general population to 21% of people experiencing homelessness. So um, we're gonna get to the happy part in a minute because there is definitely a lot of things that we are doing and that Kathy will talk about that are is good news for us at the coalition and for other service providers. But a little bit more, just hang in tight for a minute so we can talk a little bit more about some stressful things. Um, we are seeing that the future of COVID is looking a little bleak. 40 to 45 percent increase in homelessness nationwide. Um, we don't have endless moratoriums on evictions right now. That's a scary thing for us to be coming up around towards the end of the year. Um, people are losing their jobs and don't have endless unemployment benefits. We have a lot of people at risk. 400,000 in the state of Colorado or are at risk of eviction. It's a lot of people. So um, there's a lot of work that's going into that to help figure out how we're going to not have that happen. So, oh yeah, moving forward. Um, so one last little bit before we hand it over to Kathy to chat a little bit about the legislation um, is we know that we need housing. We need federal rental assistance. We need this now. So we'll tell you how you can ask for it um, at the end of this. So get your pens and papers out so you can be ready. Um, we need national eviction and foreclosure moratorium to continue for a long, long time. If the moratorium ends in December, um, what that will mean is now all of this time that people have not had to pay rent or had to pay mortgages, um, they'll now have to pay all of that money back. So it's kind of ballooned, it hasn't gone away, it's just ballooned. Um, and then it's a lar large lump sum that they need to pay. Uh, so that's a scary thing because circumstances haven't changed. People are still out of jobs, people are still um, suffering pretty dramatically, are sick. Um, etc. But now we're just kind of facing that doom and gloom portion coming up. We need more long-term housing. We know that housing saves people's lives. We have known this for 35 years that we've been providing services at the coalition. We believe housing is health care, but that is also evident in so many reports around the country that housing does save people's lives. It gives them those 30 years back that uh, people lose on the street. We need to use this crisis as an opportunity and not just go to back to business as usual once all of this goes away. Um, because it doesn't go away for people who are living on the streets. And we need to be really clear about that, that we had to put a lot of things in place to help um, mi mitigate this crisis. And, um, those, those issues will continue to live on after COVID is gone. Um, so that's really key for us. We also need healthcare. We need tons of testing, which we have had um, pretty great access to in Colorado recently, and that's been great. Um, we need treatment and isolation locations. We need people to be able to continue long-term to be able to have a space. We need that vaccine, come on vaccine. I'm very excited for that. And we need to address that mental health. So again, back to that cycle on trauma, this is going to be traumatic for everyone. Um, long term, we are all going to see the impact the trauma this has caused us, and we need to make sure that we address that. So then I'm going to stop sharing my screen so Kathy can pop on in, and I will unmute her. I think I did it. There we go. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Sure can. Great. 
Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Kathy Alderman. I am the Chief Communications and Public Policy Officer for the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. And um, so glad that my team got to present to you this evening. I always enjoy um, watching this presentation, seeing the questions that come up and, uh, you know, just doing a better job informing our community about, you know, the issue of homelessness and, and, and what's happening. Um, but in addition to going through this COVID pandemic, we also had a national election. And there were a lot of issues that we were following and trying to figure out how to respond to um, with the election. So coming off of a very bizarre legislative session, which um, was not held for the number of days that it normally would have been, we did still have some success uh, during the legislature, even though a lot of that was happening remote and under uh, extreme circumstances. We have long uh, advocated for pr the prohibition on housing discrimination based on someone's source of income. And that was something that we passed this year. And so now landlords are no longer able to say to tenants that you, you know, section eight not taken here, or you can't use um, benefits to pay for your housing costs. And um, so we were glad to have passed that and start rolling that out. We also um, strongly advocated for House Bill 1410. This used some of the CARES Act funding, so the federal dollars, to help provide for rental assistance and eviction prevention for hundreds of thousands of Coloradans. And this was just one way to use those federal dollars to make sure that people could stay stably housed so that they did not enter the cycle of homelessness to begin with. And as Meredith talked about a little bit earlier, we were pursuing telemedicine reimbursement prior to the pandemic. Emergency rules were enacted to allow for reimbursement during the initial days of the response. And so we wanted to make sure that beyond this crisis that we can continue to provide those critical telehealth services to individuals out on the streets and in their homes. You know, but this election, I think, really highlights a couple of things um, for us. And, you know, there's some good things and bad things with every election. And I think one of the biggest pluses of this election cycle was just the unprecedented turnout. And granted, we know we're living in a very partisan, divided world right now. And so, you know, sometimes when things are that divided, you don't necessarily want the people that are voting not your way to turn out but that's not how a democracy works. And so the fact that we had huge numbers of people turning out to vote, standing in long lines in the middle of a pandemic really means that we're going to have much stronger democracy moving forward. I was, you know, really excited to see that um, in Colorado we had almost 87% of our registered voters turn out and vote. Now, of course, in Colorado, we do make it really easy for people to vote. Every registered voter gets a mail-in ballot, um, but we saw a record turnout at the polls as well. And I just think that that's really encouraging um, and means that, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a stronger democracy moving forward. And in Denver, um, though they're still doing some final counts, that, that rate was um, just around 86%. But the best news was uh, for the Denver election and an issue that we advocated strongly for and led part of the campaign in partnership with the mayor's office and Councilwoman Kanich was ballot measure 2B. This was a small sales tax increase to provide about $40 million annually for homelessness programs, services, and housing. And you know, we are honored that the community came together and passed this measure with a 65% yes vote. And so these dollars now will begin to flow next year, become available for homelessness service providers and other organizations, probably mid to late, uh, mid summer to early fall. And the um, Office of Housing Stability, also known as HOST, will be administering these dollars and they will put out RFPs for organizations to apply for them. They'll be working on um, an amendment to their strategic plan to incorporate how these dollars can get be, be used in their current um, programmings and for new programs. We are also thrilled to see at the state level that Prop EE passed. This was a measure that increased um, taxes on nicotine products and um, vaping products, which were not previously taxed. And the, the good news for this is that it does um, provide more investment into um, education for you know, young folks and pre-kindergarten age um, kids. 
but it also had um, made an investment in housing that has not been made before with the tobacco tax. And it also included funds for eviction prevention, uh, which we know is just gonna be critical moving forward. And so while we know that oftentimes uh, tobacco taxes can impact, negatively impact those with the lowest income, we, we think that the balancing effect of this particular measure by investing in housing and investing in eviction prevention will benefit our community long-term in, in terms of making sure that people have adequate housing and can stay stably housed. There were a lot of other ballot measures on this ballot this year, some of which we um, had positive responses to, but we didn't necessarily uh, endorse, and then some that we had negative responses to. And so we are using the green light, uh, yellow light, red light to identify those. I will say the, the most disappointing one that did um, pass this time around was Proposition 116. That was an income tax reduction. And while that will lead to a little bit of money in everybody's pocket, it will leave a $154 million gap in the state budget, meaning that we'll have to cut those, that, those funds from education, from healthcare, and from other issues that are important to us. It also, that, that reduction in taxes is really only gonna benefit about 5% of Colorado's population with the average um, individual only receiving about $40 annually from that tax cut. So we thought that was a, a big disappointment, but we also understand that Colorado has um, really high tax sensitivity. And so whenever um, you talk about cutting taxes, uh, voters are usually uh, in favor of that. We were also monitoring our um, local elections of our state legislators, and uh, we did see a, a, an increase in the number of um, folks who are gonna be represented in our General Assembly that, are, that tend to be a little bit more supportive of housing and homelessness issues. Um, it's, it's my hope that over time, um, we'll be able to recruit more people that might be a little more conservative leaning to see housing as a crisis, not just for uh, Democrats or not just for um, you know, people who vote for Democrats, but that this is really an issue that impacts everybody across the board. And we've got to come together as a state to make sure that we're providing enough funding and enough housing resources so that we don't have this growing homelessness crisis. We also had a, a Senate race. Um, and you know I think we're really excited to say that the former Governor John Hickenlooper was, um, was elected to the US Senate. Governor Hickenlooper was the former mayor of Denver, during which time he uh, implemented Denver's Road Home to address homelessness. It was a 10-year plan to, um, to alleviate homelessness. Unfortunately, it didn't come to total fruition, but it did raise awareness and get us to the place where we could pass a measure like 2B. Governor uh, Hickenlooper was also very supportive of the Fort Lyon program. That program came to be under um, you know, his direction and his watch. So he'll be joining Senator Michael Bennett, who has been a long-term housing advocate. And I really think that these two senators together can put together a housing agenda that we can implement at the federal level to get those critical resources we need, both to address homelessness and to keep people housed who might be um, not, not stably housed right now. Interestingly enough, the, our entire Colorado um, House delegation was up for re-election. Um, six of the seven maintained their seats, but we do have one new congressional member in CD3, which is, or Congressional District, District 3, which is in um, the eastern, sorry, the western part of the state and um, southwestern part of the state. Um, Lauren Bobert was selected for, um, for that, we don't have a lot of experience uh, with her or with her office. We were, uh, we've been unable to uh, discern any specific housing policies that she might advocate for. Um, she is very conservative and her main claims of you know, policy issues are supporting um, current President Trump, um, supporting Second Amendment rights, so gun rights. Um, and so you know, we don't really know how well she will address the issues that we um, care about, but we'll certainly try to build a relationship and, um, and, and see if we can work with her. But we do still have um, very supportive members in our congressional delegation and, and Diana DeGette, Joe Nagus, Jason Crow, Ed Perlmutter, 
Um, and, you know, we're still, we continue to work with, um, with Tipton and then Buck's office. Um, unfortunately, things have, you know, as I mentioned earlier, gotten pretty politicized. And of course, we're all still waiting for the final, final um, election results to be certified across the country. Uh, you know, waiting for the current president to concede to these election results, which are pretty clear, I think, to uh, most of the country. Joe Biden had a very strong um, housing, kind of talked a little bit about housing as, as he came into office, but hasn't really done anything in that area. And certainly his um, approach to homelessness was very concerning as he started to talk about how we needed to round up people who are experiencing homelessness and um, basically warehouse them, uh, you know, to address substance use and mental health and to make sure that people couldn't see homelessness because it was just too awful to see. And we know that's not the, the right approach. And so we are hoping that with a new president, a new administration, new cabinet members overseeing the um, Housing and Urban Development Office or HUD, that we might see a, a, some new investments and a reinvigoration of some political will to address homelessness at the federal level and get those critical resources to states. We are still obviously waiting to find out how the US Senate uh, will be led. Um, there are two races in Georgia that are going to run off. That won't happen until uh, January. So we won't really know what the control of the Senate, which will really determine whether or not our new president gets to push his legislative agenda forward. And so we're, we're watching that closely, um, but also just hoping that, you know, with a new administration, we can even do things that don't require legislative action. Perhaps we can get more action from HUD through regulation and lifting of restrictions, and um, maybe we could get some executive orders that could be a little bit more responsive to the crisis that we're in, the homelessness crisis that we're in within the COVID-19 crisis. A balance of our um, House of Representatives remains uh, with the Democrats, and we know that they did pass the HEROES Act. This was a bill for COVID response that provided a, a great deal of funding for homelessness services, for rental assistance, and to help people with um, the high unemployment. Unfortunately, this bill has been sitting in, in the Senate um, with no action taken on it for far too long. And so we really hope that, you know, as Congress reconvenes after the first of the year, that they will take the HEROES Act back up and make sure that they get those critical resources to states and to individuals who, who need them. I will end uh, again with um, other good news. Some of these headlines were things that just really um, stood out to me as election results came in. We are seeing a higher level of diversity and people being elected to office. That is gonna be good. We're seeing people getting elected to office that are uh, you know, of different ethnicities, different races, different backgrounds, and people that have more lived experience um, and that will, I think, result in better policies moving forward because we'll really have a, a government that represents the people that they are governing. Some of the other um, things that President-elect Biden had in his original housing plan was you know, to, to eliminate some of those discriminatory practices that have led to homelessness having such a disparate impact on uh, communities of color. He also has um, a lot of plans for greater investments in providing more housing and to helping low-income people obtain housing. And I think that you know, these approaches are really going to be critical in addressing some of those housing shortages that both uh, Jill and Meredith talked about. And uh, you know, unlike the, the current president, this president wants to take a comprehensive and compassionate approach to addressing homelessness. And I do have optimism moving forward that we will um, see some better policies and hopefully some better cooperation among our federal agencies. So one of the things that we do every uh, fall is we talk about our legislative agenda uh, for the Colorado General Assembly. And so this year, as we look ahead to ge that General Assembly, which will begin in um, January, we're not sure how exactly it's gonna look. Um, probably a lot of it will be virtual, but the things that we're gonna be looking out for is really making sure um, that our state government takes a, a comprehensive approach to the COVID response. 
and uses every state resource to make sure that people are experiencing homelessness can get into safe spaces and that people that are currently housed can stay housed. Some of these issues will be addressed in a special session that's gonna be held just after Thanksgiving, uh, but we'll, we'll need to pursue legislative initiatives during session to continue our response. We also were very fortunate in 2019 to secure some funding for housing that the state of Colorado previously didn't have. However, with huge budget gaps, we know those funding sources are at risk, and so we're going to have to protect them while we continue to find additional revenue sources for housing funding. We've long been working on renters' protections and preventing evictions, uh, you know, especially for low-income renters, and that's the same thing that we'll be doing this session, especially in response to COVID. And then on the healthcare side, we need to make sure we're protecting access to telemedicine, we'll need to expand access for substance use treatment, and we need to make sure that everybody, no matter what their income status, has adequate access to primary and behavioral health care. We should have our legislative priorities available and ready to share. Um, you're getting a preview, but, um, but we'll have them more fleshed out by the end of the week. So for those of you that are on our email list and um, access our website regularly, you will be able to see those. So I'm not positive that my Poll Everywhere will work, but we'll try it. Um, if you're still logged into Poll Everywhere, we do have one uh, question here to know what, what are the issues that you would like to see us advocate um, for, and what would you be most likely to join in to advocate for if we provided those opportunities? And I'm guessing that my poll everywhere does not work. So I am going to stop sharing and maybe Jill and or Meredith could um, make that work. Yep, I am pulling it up. And I think I even took that slide out of mine when I did ours. So just answer the question and we will send out the results for you. So don't fret about that. And um, we'll get you those answers in the PowerPoint when I share it with you guys. Um, I'm going to share my screen now for our last few things we want to chat about with you. And then we'll, we'll take the rest of our questions. So our next steps. So now that you've heard from Kathy and from myself and from Jill, um, we, we know you have lots of questions and lots of things that you probably are excited and interested in helping us to do. And so here's a few of them. On Thursday, which would be tomorrow, is our National Day of Action for COVID Relief. So we've heard about that from Kathy and from myself. So if you are not currently signed up for our action alerts, do so now. You just go to our website and at the tippy top of the screen, it'll say sign up for your, our newsletter and get yourself signed up so that you can receive this email tomorrow so that you can um, participate in this day of action. It is really meaningful as Jill was talking about, about our advocacy efforts that we have community members who believe the same things we do and want to share that with our legislators. Um, it matters when they hear from their constituents. So please don't feel like um, your voice is not included in this conversation. It absolutely is. So please, please, please participate. And then the last thing that we are inviting you to is uh, our, every year we host uh, the Homeless Persons Memorial Vigil. It is typically on the steps of the city and county building, always on the uh, 21st of December. This year will look a little bit differently. Um, we will have this event. We are unsure if it will be in person or if it will be uh, digital if it needs to be, but we are keeping our fingers crossed that we are able to still not be at stay home and that people have done all their best efforts to stay safe so that we can host this event. It will be socially distanced. Uh, if it is in person, it will have all of the necessary precautions, but this year it will be on the street instead of right outside of the city and county building. So just on Bannock Street, right outside of the building. And it will be a um, walking memorial. So we will have timed entry for that. You can only come if you're 
household and we will space everyone out so that you can walk through and see all of the names and then we'll provide a recording following that event. It's important that we host that event as best we can in public because people experiencing homelessness, this is their way to mourn their friends and loved ones who have passed away and um, they may not have access to the internet to see something that's digital. So we wanna offer that space if we're able to. And we've been doing it for 30 years, so this is our 31st and that's um, important to us as well. And then last but not least, Connect with us. We'd love for you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And as I mentioned a couple of times, and I'm going to say it one more time, please sign up for our emails so you receive all of our advocacy action alerts and find out how you can get involved in what we're doing. And feel free to email us if you have specific policy questions. Kathy, her email is there. If you have any specific questions about what we talked about today, email Meredith or I, and we're always happy to talk with folks and uh, have more advocates. And I just wanna say thank you so much for kind of working with us while we had, I had some audio issues and Meredith having to switch over and share her screen. If you know me, I always have audio issues. So this is nothing new. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's an endless, an endless effort. Um, Ryan, do you have any questions in the audience that we should address for the last two minutes that we have? Um, yeah, let's do a quick one here. Um, since the majority of people on this meeting do not have direct lived experience with homelessness, what have you seen as the most effective ways of compassion building and understanding the complexities of homelessness? Great. Um, this is a great question to ask um, because we have a cool document that I will now include um, that's called What Do I Do? Um, and it's just kind of an indicator of how you could respond in the community as a citizen. What is the best way to react to certain situations, um, which can look very different depending on the situation. So it's kind of a Q&A that will go through uh, all of those different issues. But um, I think Jill and I, and I, I know that I feel this, that we always act with compassion. And that means that we use what's called trauma-informed care, which looks through the lens of what happened to you, not what did you do wrong. And that kind of changes the dynamic of every conversation thereafter. Um, and I think it makes it um, an easier way to be compassionate to not just only people experiencing homelessness, but my friends and loved ones and everyone I know that um, it's easier to, to be able to, to um, listen and hear their story rather than kind of put on the marker of what they did that is for them to blame. So um, that's kind of the, the biggest one. The second one for me is to make eye contact, look people in the eyes uh, and ask them their name. There's always a tale to be told of someone who's experiencing homelessness, just like someone who is housed. And um, it's, it's really uh, something that has hit me hard is to hear from some of the people who experience homelessness that no one's asked their name. They, no one said their name out loud. No one's shaken their hand um, or acknowledged their existence. And um, that's something that I think we can all take a little lesson from is just how to be a little more compassionate as we see people. And then all those other questions about do I give money or do I not, or um, what do I do and the, all of, if I see someone who's intoxicated or, uh, any or if I see police who are badgering someone, all of those questions are answered in that um, Q and A that we have. So I actually think it's on our website as well. But I will be sure to include it. So if you have been on this call, you will receive a copy of that. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, let's go for. Has consideration been given to converting empty commercial buildings or spaces to affordable housing to save the money and time required when building new? Um, maybe we should unmute Kathy. Um, I was just about to do. Probably have a little bit more insight into this than we do. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think uh, you heard about Fusion Studios, which was converting a, a motel from motel space to studio apartments. And I think that there is a lot of interest in trying to figure out if we can do more of that because those already are, are already semi-residential spaces. 
but there is an, an effort to think about where can we find some additional space or how can we use property that we already own and convert it to like dorm style living or some kind of transitional housing options. And we have you know, worked with the state government, we've worked with city government to, to find out if there are any of these properties available. And right now we haven't really been able to access um, anything that would produce kind of what we need right now, but it is an ongoing conversation. And I think as we try to figure out how to address the, the increased street homelessness, we're going to have to have other spaces for people to go. And it does make a lot more sense to use current spaces and convert them rather than build from the ground up, which takes so much longer and costs so much more. Thank you. I think we're at time, so we are probably going to wrap up, but um, feel free if you have additional questions that are not answered uh, when I, I'll send an email out tomorrow. We, it will include the recording as well as the slides, as well as some of those documents that we chatted about. Um, if there's some other questions you have, just feel free to email me and I will get the answer and then we will share as much as we can and we will be sending out our next year's education series we haven't quite finalized that list yet but when we do you'll know so thank you all thank you so much